So Johnson and Felicia, if we can get you to bring your little girl up to the front. What an incredible privilege it is for me to be able to join you as a couple in this. Um, this is a rare blessing. <laughs> so I'll, I'll come down here with you guys. Children, children are gifts that are given to us from God. And uh, they are to be held with delight and joy. And I think we all, we all have those times. We all have times of delight and joy. We all have the times of trials and difficulties. But they are an incredible gift that is given to us from God. And then we read in the Gospels that Jesus took a child just like this. And he took it in his arms. And he said that when we welcome a child in the name of Jesus, that we actually welcome Jesus himself. And not only do we welcome Jesus, but we actually welcome God who sent Jesus when we welcome this child. So this is, this is a privilege for us as a church, for you as a family, and uh, we just welcome that in the name of Jesus. And just as a rose opens in its own time and it has its own unique kind of beauty, so it's our desire that this little girl would grow and blossom into all that God has created her to be. And we acknowledge today that God has already welcomed this child into his family and welcomed this little one with abundant grace. So we have, if we have, there it is up there already. So we just, if you would join with us in kind of a, a congregational, together we welcome this little girl into, into the church here. We'll just, if you can kind of read and, and repeat to me what is on the screen there, and we will work through this together. For God has formed, oh, is it Brielle or Brielle? Brielle? Okay. For God has formed Brie, Brielle in her mother's womb. So we will praise God, for she is fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are his works. God said, before I formed Brielle in the womb, I knew her. Brielle, what a privilege it is to have you here and to hold you in our arms. Mm -hmm. With God's her, with help, we will give you space and time to become all that God desires you to be. And by the power of the Spirit, provide all that you need to feel safe, nourished, loved, and esteemed. Just let me pray. Heavenly Father, how good you are. And how wonderful are your works, and we see it before us in these children. And we bring Brielle to you this morning. We praise you for all your gifts, and especially for the gifts of this dear child. So we take her to our hearts, and we welcome her into our church family. As a token of your love, and gratefully we give her back to you, to love and to serve you all of her days. And we do this in the mighty name of our Jesus, our Savior, and Lord. Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, yes. Awesome. Those of you that know me know I like to tell stories, but uh, I'll just let the song tell the story because it does that. <laughs> I 
How could I know? How could I say who you are? You speak these words. You show us your miracles. Now I stand in awe. I can't believe all these things you've done. Here, you ask who I say you are. I am has come, I am is here. Yahweh is the one to save us from fear. Some people say A prophet, a sage, that's all Some people say He's just a good man, that's all Now I stand in awe I can't believe who they say you are Oh, you look at me, you ask who I say you are, you are, I am has come, I am is here, Yahweh is the one to save us from fear. Christ you are Jesus God's Son Beginning and the end Oh, I am has come But when it I deny that I knew your name You bled and you died You perished for all my shame Now I stand in awe I cannot believe my eyes Oh, before me now the man who was dead is alive. He's alive. I am has come. I am is here. Yahweh is the one to save us from fear. The Christ you are. Jesus, God's Son, beginning and the end, oh, I am has come, I am has come. go now that's what it <laughs> thank you <laughs> well that is awesome thank you very much 
What a good morning already. Amen? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Yes, he is. David was saying he likes to tell stories. I like to tell stories as well. I can relate to that. I want to start this morning by telling you a story of my grandfather. I am, I am the child of immigrants, as uh, pretty much all of us are. If, uh, unless you happen to be Aboriginal in background, you are probably an immigrant here, or you are the child of immigrants. My mum's family comes from the country of Ireland. They came over to Canada and uh, made a life here. My dad's family come from a Mennonite background. They came over to here from the Ukraine. My grandfather's grandfather came over here initially in 1876, and they started living just south of Winkler in a little town called Austerwick. When my, when my grandfather was born, he was now the, the second generation and the third generation to be born or to be living here. They moved to Saskatchewan. When Saskatchewan became a province and they were opened up homesteading grants, my, my grandfather's dad took the government up on that and they moved along with a bunch of other people to an area called Lost River. It was close to what is now Nippon, Saskatchewan. And that's where he grew up. And being in a homesteading area, there was lots of logging, lots of clearing of land, lots of kind of that kind of work that it took to actually take that homesteaded land and turn it into something that was useful. I keep wanting to wander around here and I'm walking out of your camera. <laughs> But uh, my grandfather, as he became a man, started working, he started his own lumber mill, and that's where he worked. And my grandfather, although he came from a religious background, was actually quite a nasty, angry man. He grew up the son of an alcoholic, he became an alcoholic himself, and he was a very nasty, mean man. He was religious in that they had kind of a religious background and they went to church but religious wouldn't really describe the way that he lived and the family that my dad grew up in was pretty rough and uh, when I met my grandfather as a little child my grandfather was blind he had had an accident a farming accident he got diesel fuel or kerosene from a tractor that rolled. He got that in his eyes and he went blind. And uh, be partly because of the accident, part because of, partly because of his own stubbornness and not leaving bandages alone, um, he ended up blind. And so when I met him, my grandfather was, was this grumpy man that none of us liked. And he didn't like any of us as little kids. We made too much noise. We were in the way. And he made wicker baskets that... Uh, People from far and wide knew George Brown. He was the wicker man. <laughs> he made wicker baskets and, uh, and sold those, and that's how he tried to make a living. And that's how I remember my grandfather. He was just a very grumpy, nasty man that we really didn't want to be around. But later on in his life, my grandfather, this religious man from a Mennonite background who had spent a lot of his years as an alcoholic and and beating his wife and beating his kids. Later on in life, he actually met Jesus and he got saved. And although that didn't seem to really change him a whole lot, there was, there was a relationship with Jesus. We didn't know Grandpa really. He spoke low, low German um, from a Mennonite background. We didn't understand that. And uh, so we just we didn't really have much to do with him. As my grandpa aged and he got, he got older into his, into his 70s, because he was blind, he, re he really wasn't very mobile. And so his life kind of consisted from, of going from his, ba from his bedroom to the kitchen table, to the bathroom, to his chair in the living room, and that was kind of the extent of his life. And it got to the point where the muscles in his legs began to kind of atrophy because he wasn't doing anything and he was in a lot of pain all the time. He was, he was, 
he was kind of complaining lots and lots and lots because of the pain in his legs. And so my dad got to finally convinced him that if he would just go for a little walk with my dad every day, it would start to build a little bit of muscle tone in his legs and it would help him with the pain. It would get rid of some of that pain if, if he would just walk for a little bit. And so the first day that my dad walked with him, he walked out the front door of the house, down three stairs, the length of the sidewalk to the sidewalk that went past the front of their house and back and he was exhausted. But every day, dad came after work and he took grandpa for a walk. And one day grandpa says, it, it seems like we're walking an awfully long way. <laughs> and dad said, well, actually, you are improving and we're walking a half a block. To my horror as a young man, when grandpa realized that he was actually getting better, he quit. And you could, you could literally mark from that day where my grandpa went downhill health-wise and he ended up in the hospital and he died in the hospital. As a young man, I was 17 years old at the time, I was 18 when he passed away, I just, I could not believe that he just quit. But something, there was two things that happened in the hospital that for me, the point of this whole story, for me, the whole point of Easter in my life was, was seen in my grandpa's life. Even though he was this nasty man that really didn't deserve anything from God, God in his mercy and his grace met him and he entered into a relationship with Jesus. And one day my dad was at work and they didn't have cell phones and everything at that point, but, but da my dad's boss came to him in the carpenter's shop where he was and he told him that the people from the hospital has phoned and your dad is kind of in a crisis and you need to go to the hospital. So my dad went up to the hospital and the nurses were really troubled because my grandpa didn't speak English, but he was very clearly upset and something was really wrong and uh, he, was, he was very troubled. And so when my dad began to talk with him, he found that, <coughs> excuse me, he found that grandpa was actually, even though he's blind, he was seeing demons sitting on the end of his bed laughing at him. And, uh, and he was just kind of, to coin a phrase, he was, he was freaked out. <laughs> he was really upset. They're laughing at me. They're coming for me. And so my dad explained to him, actually, you have asked Jesus Christ to be your savior. He, is, he has entered in your life and you have the authority as a child of God to tell those demons to leave, to go, to get away from you, to leave you alone. And so he prayed with his dad as that, as, and that is exactly what happened. These the demons left. He wasn't troubled after that. But soon after that, there was another situation where my dad gets a phone call and he, he actually managed to talk to the nurse and they said, you need to come to the hospital right away because your dad is passing away. He's, he's very close to death. And so my dad went up to the hospital again and he told me as he, was, as he was sitting beside the bed beside grandpa, he was holding his hand and he said his hand, you could feel his hand getting colder and colder. His heartbeat was getting slower and slower. His breathing was getting more and more shallow. <coughs> and then my grandfather who was so weak that he could hardly even, he couldn't sit up by himself anymore. He couldn't function at all. He was that sick and that weak. All of a sudden, this blind, weak man sat just bolt upright in his bed and just staring at the ceiling. And dad said he just kind of cried out three times, just, amen, amen, amen. And he laid down, and he was gone. I tell that story because that is the reality of Easter in my life. We serve a risen Savior who has defeated death. The curse of sin has been broken because of this event that we call Easter. 
And Easter and the resurrection in my life are very real because I see that in the life of my grandfather who I really didn't like. But he witnessed the angels coming to usher him into heaven. God's mercy and his grace is very real to me. I've seen it in my grandfather. That is why we can dedicate a little child this morning. We can dedicate this child to the Lord in the confidence that... (coughs) (coughs) Ruth, could you get me a glass of water, please? Thank you. Just got a dry throat here. (coughs) But we can take this child who has come into this world that is very troubled... And there's a lot of difficulties and there's a lot of things that would make us question. But we can take this child and we can say, God, you have blessed us with this child and we in turn bring this child back to you in confidence saying, please take this child that is your gift, your creation, and we confidently bring Brielle to you knowing that what you have started, you will bring to completion. We have that confidence because the curse has been broken. The power of sin has been broken, death has been defeated, and we can live in confidence knowing that as children of God, we serve a risen, conquering, victorious Savior. Amen? Amen. Amen. Death is not the final verdict anymore. Thank you, Carol. The disciples, I want to go to the story of the disciples. The disciples saw Jesus do a lot of things. It says in the book of John that, that uh, John chapter 20, it says the disciples saw Jesus do many other miracles. The ones that are written in the Bible are just a small portion of what Jesus actually did. He did lots of other things that weren't recorded. But he says these things are written so that you may know the Son of God, And that by believing in him, you will have life. I want you to kind of use your little bit of your imagination this morning and imagine (coughs) what it would be, what it would have been like to be one of the disciples walking with Jesus. He comes to the different places where they were and he says, I want you to come and follow me. And then this incredible experience started that literally turned their world upside down. It started at a wedding. They're they're following this Jesus who grew up just a stone's throw away from them, but he claims to be somebody different. But they went to a wedding and they run out of wine. And so the Jesus, this teacher they're following, tells them and along with the people who are the servants in the house to just take these wine pots and pour some water into them. And then they take that water and they bring out and they serve the finest of wine. What would you think? The people who were at the wedding didn't know what happened, but the disciples knew what happened. The servants knew what happened. This took everything that had happened in their life to this point and, and kind of turned it upside down. Water doesn't turn into wine just because you poured it into a wine pot. But then, imagine as you keep on going. Peter is in a situation where he owes tax money and he doesn't have it. And so Jesus says, well, you need to honor that. You need to honor and pay your taxes. So, why, Peter, why don't you go fishing? Well, Peter's a fisherman. Peter knows that there's a lot of fishing to do in order to pay taxes. No, no, Peter, just go and catch one fish. So Peter goes to catch this fish, and his tax money is in the mouth of the fish. You thought it strange maybe that God gave Dean the application to my message? Well, God gave Peter's tax money to the fish. (laughs) He's in the business of doing things differently, but how do you deal with that? How do you, like, is that just circumstance? Like, how do you explain this? Our, Our life is turning upside down here. Things are very different. How do you explain? Imagine as a disciple... You are in this huge crowd that is following Jesus. There's 5,000 plus people here. 
And Jesus takes these loaves and these couple fishes and he says, I want you to, to take this and give it to the people. What do you think when you take the loaf that's in your hand and you break it and you give it to Billy and then you give it to Billy's sister and you give it to Billy's mom and dad and you give it to their neighbor but you've still got a loaf in your hand and you keep on giving it out and you keep on giving it out and you give it to hundreds of people and you give it to thousands of people but there's still a loaf in your hand. It doesn't disappear. How do you explain that? How do you deal with that in your mind? How do you wrap your head around what is happening here? Everything that you know about life is changing. And then after that, you jump in a boat and you go across the sea. And in the middle of the sea, you come up with this huge storm and you're a fisherman. You know what storms are like. And you, as a fisherman, are really... um, kind of taken back because we were on the verge of dying here. That's what the story says. They were scared they were dying. And so they wake Jesus up who's sleeping in the middle of this incredible storm and he stands up and he speaks to the storm and he says, be quiet. And immediately it says the wind is gone and the water is calm. We live on the prairies. We know that the wind just doesn't immediately disappear. And if you've been on the lake, you know that the waves don't just all of a sudden quit. It takes a long time for that momentum to quit. But it says the wind was quiet and the water was quiet. And it says they were scared, they were petrified. Who is this? (laughs) Who is this that even can command the wind and the waves to be still? They were scared. What have we gotten ourselves into? The food doesn't disappear even though we're passing it out. The water turns into wine. The wind and the waves obey him. I was shocked one morning when they, we sang a new song in church and part of the words were, the wind and the waves still know his name. And God kind of spoke that into my heart like I'm still the same one. I'm still the one. I still command the wind and the waves. He's, we still serve the same God. And then this Jesus, <laughs> this Jesus who dies and he comes back to life. Like, how do you deal with those things? But all of those kind of things that were happening, but listen, listen to some stories now that, that really, really rocked their world. Like, those things were incredible. Those things would have changed their world. Those things would have really made a difference in how they were perceiving what was happening but Jesus came one point and he was talking to Mary and Martha the the brother they're the sisters of Lazarus they had called him because Lazarus was dying and Jesus told Martha you don't need to worry because I am the resurrection and the life I am resurrection I am life well that's pretty good theology that's pretty good words to speak that's good comfort to give to somebody but imagine imagine walking along with Jesus and actually experiencing this picture this they were coming in Luke chapter 7 verse 11 to 17 they were coming into this town by the name of Nain and as they're coming into town there's a funeral procession that is coming out a widowed woman her husband had died She has one son, and that son has now died. And he's being carried out of the city on a funeral pyre, and there's a procession coming out with him. Now, in that culture, if your husband dies, and you you are a widow, it is the responsibility of your family to look after you, because there is no one else. There is no social networks. There is no social kind of uh, net to catch us. Your family looked after you. And now this woman had lost her husband and this woman had lost her son and she is in trouble. And it says that Jesus was moved by compassion and as they came close to him, he stopped the procession and he went up to the funeral pyre and he spoke to the dead man and he says, get up. And the dead man sat up 
and he got off the funeral pyre and he went to look after his mother. It says they were all incredibly afraid. What has come to us? Imagine that. You go to a funeral and somebody comes and opens the coffin and tells the guy to get out and he gets out. I put that into our terms. That, that doesn't happen. We know that 100% of people that are born die and they stay dead. We know that. <laughs> but not for them. They were freaked out. And then they're in another situation just a chapter later in Luke and one of the synagogue officials comes to Jesus and he's, he's coming to Jesus because his daughter is dying. She's really seriously sick. And he's coming to Jesus because he wants Jesus to heal his daughter. And as he is coming to Jesus, someone from his family comes and tells him, you don't need to bother the master anymore because your daughter has actually died. She's passed away. It's done. It's over. Don't bother him. Jesus says, no, no, no. It's not over. She hasn't died. She's simply asleep. And so he goes to the synagogue official's house. And he, taught, he tells them, don't worry, don't be afraid, because this girl has simply fallen asleep. And they laugh at him, and they mock him. They know what death is. They know what has happened. This girl is dead. It's done. The story is over. There's just nothing left but the grieving. And Jesus sends them all the mockers out of the house, and he takes the mother and the father and a couple of his disciples, and he goes into the bedroom where the child is, and he lifts her hand, and he says, get up. And she gets up. He says, you need to give her something to eat now. Everything they know about life and death is changing. Absolutely everything. The dead don't walk. We hear lots about zombies and all these kind of movies that come out of Hollywood now. Well, it doesn't happen. You know, it's movie stuff. I don't know if they had movies back then. I'm pretty sure they didn't have electric projectors. But, uh, like, it... People die and it's over. But not for them. Their life was changing. And then they watched Jesus. <coughs> they watched him be crucified. <coughs> they watched him die. It was a horrifying, horrible thing. And they knew where they put him in the grave. They were there. He was dead. He's been crucified. And they put him in a grave in a tomb, and they rolled the rock across the front of it. They posted a guard of elite soldiers to guard that tomb. And when they came back three days later, he's gone. And then they're sitting in a room together, and he shows up. Not walking through the door, not walking, you know, not, there's no knock on the door. Hi, it's Jesus here. Can you let me in? He just showed up. And they're scared. They are freaked out. Imagine what they thought when that same man went to Lazarus' place and opened the tomb and said, Lazarus, come on, come out here. <clears throat> We're waiting for you. And this Lazarus that they had wrapped in grave clothes comes walking out of the cave. <laughs> Everything they know is changing. It says... If you read in the gospel account of Matthew, you read in, in the account of when Jesus was crucified and buried, when he came back to life, it says that when Jesus died, that there was darkness that covered over the land for a period of three hours, and there was a huge storm, and there was an earthquake. And it says in Matthew that a lot of the tombs in the area opened up. And then when Jesus was resurrected, not only was Jesus in their presence, but it says that there was a whole bunch of the saints who had died who actually came back to life and went into the city and were visiting and meeting with their, with their relatives and with their family. How do you explain this? Everything that they know, and this is the, the multiple times I've said it, <laughs> I know I'm saying it, but everything they know about life and death is changing. Nothing is the same because we serve a risen Savior 
who has defeated death. He has defeated the curse. He has defeated all that has come before him. And we are now, in the name of Jesus, we are conquerors. We are overcomers. Death is no longer the final verdict. I walked into the church here two weeks ago or three weeks ago, whatever it was, and I met Diane, and I asked her, is Blaine coming? I hadn't heard that Blaine had passed away. One day, I am going to stand beside Blaine, and I'm going to hear his bass voice just booming out again. I'm going to sing with Blaine again because I serve an overcoming risen Savior. I'm going to sing with my dad. He died when I was 32 years old. (laughs) And that will be a glorious experience because if you know my dad, my dad always told everybody, I know that there is lots of music in me because none of it has ever come out. (laughs) My dad could not sing worth anything. He was terrible. We would sit in church and my dad would sit behind us. We had seven kids in our family, so we'd be all lined up and my dad and mom would sit in the, pre- in the pew behind us and we would listen to my dad sing and it was painful. It hurt. He, he loved music, but he could not sing. I'm going to sing with my dad and it's going to be glorious and my Jesus is going to be blessed. Because death is no longer the final verdict, people. Death is no longer the final verdict. I want to finish this message this morning by reading scripture and listening, listening to what it says. Because I couldn't, I couldn't say it any better than this. John read some of this at the beginning of the service. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 Listen to what it says. This is our hope. This is what we have to offer the world. We live in a time that is desperately hopeless. People, hope is not what people are kind of talking about right now. We have a message to give them. Listen to what 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says. But someone may ask, how will the dead be raised What kind of bodies will they have? What a foolish question. When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. And what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow, but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you are planting. And then God gives it the new body that he wants it to have. There's a graphic picture here. A different plant grows from each kind of seed. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They're buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. My grandfather was so sick he couldn't sit up and he's blind, he couldn't see a thing for many, many years. All he could see was a little bit of light or darkness. That was the extent of his sight. His body was buried in brokenness and weakness but he will see Jesus face to face. Hallelujah. The scripture tells us the first man, Adam, became a living person But the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. What comes first is the natural body, and then the spiritual body comes later. Adam, the first man, was made from the dust of the earth, while Christ, the second man, came from heaven. Earthly people are like the earthly man, and heavenly people are like the heavenly man. Just as we are now, Like the earthly man, we will someday be like the heavenly man. What I am saying, dear brothers and sisters, is that our physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. But let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. 
Are you ready? We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And Blaine will walk with us again. <laughs> Amen. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. And our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. And then when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled that says death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Where is your victory? For sin is the sting that results in death and the law gives sin its power. But thank God he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. This world is not all there is. There will come a day when we step through this veil of death and we walk physically into the presence of Jesus. That is the message of Easter. If all there is is what is in this world around us, what a hopeless, horrifying situation we are in. But it's not over, folks. God is not done yet. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord will, will be useless. The, the Apostle John, he writes in the book of 1 John chapter 3, the letter that he was writing, and he says in chapter 3, See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. But the people who belong to the world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, but he has not yet shown us what it will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him because we will see him as he is. That is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. We will be like him because we will see him like he is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. What it's saying is that this message of eternal life, this message of going to be with Jesus, when we grasp that, when we wrap our heads around it, that we have been saved and we are going to be given this eternal body and we will live with Jesus in his presence physically for eternity, it will change who I am. And purity and service and honoring God with my life, what, the, what this has been given to me, will become the way I live. The Apostle Paul kind of echoed some of those thoughts when he says in the communion passage that we often read, he says, for what I received to the Lord, I actually passed on to you. And we're going to make a transition into communion time, but that is actually what God wants us to do, to take what we have received and pass it on. Jesus said just before he went back to heaven, he said, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be my witnesses. God doesn't ask us to save the world. He just says, what you've received, pass it on. Give it away. Just like the bread, keep on giving it and giving it and giving it because it'll never, it'll never disappear. You'll never give too much. You can't give too much. Just pass it on. Paul said, for what I received from the Lord, I also pass on to you. Communion is the perfect picture for Easter. We serve a God, a Savior, who gave his body for us. What you and I deserved, if God was to be perfectly just, we want justice in this world. We want justice. We cry out for that oftentimes. 
But if God would have given us perfect justice, we'd all be dead. Because the wages of sin is death. But thankfully, God is not only perfect justice, but God is mercy and God is grace. And so on the cross, the penalty for sin was paid for because he paid it. And justice was satisfied. But mercy was also satisfied because now the relationship that we were created for is possible. Because Jesus can look at us and say, the penalty that you deserved, that you earned, I paid. And now what I'm offering is life. And so we take these elements. There's kind of two little covers on here. You take the top one off and it will reveal the wafer. It says, Jesus, he took some bread and he broke it. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We don't believe that this is the physical, actual, real body of Jesus that is taught in some circles, but this represents, it's a, it's a picture. This represents the body of Christ that was given for you. And he said, take it and eat it in remembrance of me. Father, we just thank you that, that in your goodness and your mercy and your grace, you were willing to go to the cross to pay the penalty that we deserved. We deserved death and you paid that for us. And now you say, you tell us, Take this bread that signifies as a symbol of my body and take it in remembrance of me. Let's partake of this together. You carefully flip back this second layer and you will reveal the cup. Jesus bled and died. We have lots of beautiful pictures of the cross. There was nothing beautiful about it. It was a horrible, gory, awful picture. But Jesus willingly gave his life for you and me. It says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you Eat this bread and drink this cup. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We talked about this a month ago when we we went through the whole Passover and all the cups. And part of this is looking back and remembering what Jesus has done for us and our thankfulness and and in his mercy, we are thankful for what he did. But also, there's another side of this where we look forward and we proclaim By this action of taking communion, we proclaim his death until he comes. We proclaim victory. We proclaim overcoming. We proclaim a conquering savior. And we do that in the name of Jesus. In the name of mercy and grace, he paid the price. And we now are a people who are overcomers because of our relationship with him. So let's take the cup together. Father, we don't deserve mercy and grace. We haven't earned that at all. And yet, in your goodness and your mercy, what you offer us life. In this Easter, Father, the message that I just have been reminded of over and over again is that the curse has been broken. Death has been defeated And we just thank you for that. Thank you that we serve a risen Savior. He is risen indeed. Amen.
I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow For nothing good have I Whereby thy grace to claim I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's land And Jesus paid it all All to Him I owe Sin had left a crimson stain He washed it white as snow And when before the throne I stand in Him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat and Jesus paid it all all to Him I owe sin had left a grief and stain he washed it white as snow and Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow and sin had left a crimson sun stay he washed it white as snow. I'd like to finish this morning with another little story I got up early this morning and I was sitting having a coffee outside my window our, our dog was sitting outside there and all of a sudden two little juncos, two little birds hit our window and uh, we have a swing on our deck and the dog was sitting on the swing and when they hit the window one of them landed actually under the swing and so he jumped off and the swing is moving back and forth so he had to crawl right down kind of with his head almost on the ground and he crawled underneath the swing and, and that little bird died. And he kind of nudged it with his nose and it was dead and he, he backed out. And, and then he realized that the other one was actually sitting on a little table that we have on the deck there. And it was still alive and he jumped up on the chair and worked his way just cautiously he kind of put his nose right up to that little bird that was still alive and he kind of nudged it with his nose a little bit and the bird kind of flicked a little bit and he jumped back and realizing it was alive he just sat there and watched it and every once in a while he would kind of go closer again and give it a little nudge and, and then he backed off and I sat there just amazed at watching what was happening and he kind of cared, cared for this little bird my dog I looked at what was happening. I expected him to just kind of eat it. <laughs> Here's free breakfast. But he just nudged it and kept nudging it as it came back to life and it came back to consciousness. And God said to me this morning, he said, you may not have the lion and the lamb living in peace in your place, but I just showed you a picture of the dog and the bird. And the curse has been broken. And what we bring to you this Easter is peace. Even my dog knew it this morning. 
And people, God offers you peace this morning. I don't know what your situation is. You may be grieving like Diane. You may be working through horrible situations in your family. I don't know what your situation is, but God comes to you this Easter morning and he says, because of what I accomplished on that cross, I bring you peace. That peace can be yours. If you don't know that peace this morning, talk to somebody before you leave. You don't have to talk to a pastor. People all around you know Jesus and they can lead you. They can help you. I'm willing to talk to you if you need to talk. But... Jesus offers you peace this morning. In the middle of all this chaotic world that we're living in, we have the peace that passes all understanding. So Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for peace that passes all understanding, that makes absolutely no sense in this situation, but it's given to us because you have defeated the curse. You have defeated sin. You have defeated death. And you tell us that we are overcomers in the name of Jesus. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. Not death, not life, not peril, not anything that comes along, not anything can separate us because you are an overcoming God and you have given us that overcoming spirit. And we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. And I bless you with peace this Easter. Go in peace.